our issue at this point, though, is that the, um, <coughs> I don't want to say this, the level of earth changes that are going to affect all of us in 2010 will not be to such a, a strength that the populace of the U.S. will be overly concerned by them. Yeah, it's going to be horrific. We're going to have big earthquakes, uh, giant tornadoes, huge um, uh, hurricanes, that kind of problem, and droughts and fires. But in the main, it's going to be our social degradation that's got everybody occupied mm -hmm. in 2010. Mm -hmm. But 2011, when the alien war stuff shows up, then we've got a... Um, very disturbing amount of data suggesting that a good portion of our time will be spent attempting to cope on a daily basis with the changes and challenges that the climate and the planet are throwing at us. So it may get to the point where um, in 2011, assuming that you you know commuted to work, that maybe every day you'd get up and just wonder if you were going to be able to make it through that day's rain or whatever to get to work. In other words, it'll impact you on a daily basis. Do you think uh, being on high ground, a uh, couple thousand feet above sea level, is going to be important? I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's that's the issue. Um, it all has to do with personal karma. Okay. Sure. You know, everybody's karma is their own. If you when the day you're going to die is the day you're going to die, regardless. Now, our our issue here is that getting to altitude makes some sense under certain conditions, but there's no guarantee, for instance, that any high altitude spot is going to remain high altitude. That we may indeed, if we go through this. Um, this uh, magnetism, in a very severe way, we may get to the point where the whole continents subside, in which case it doesn't matter if you're... I hate uh, it when that happens, man. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it just, just ruins your day. <laughs> but the real issue for us is that the following. There's this thing out there called the Narmer Plate. Narmer is the, or Narm, Narma is the name of the place that uh, we call Egypt today, uh, and that's what the people used to call it. And way back when, they made this plate of um, material, and they put inscribed 11 uh, passages, such as we're going through now, and described what occurred on each of the previous 11 ones, and some were worse than others. The last one was not quite so bad. It was a ca catastrophe, there's no question, but it wasn't, wasn't as bad as the previous two. And so there seems to be some suggestion that we're sort of winding down on the, on the uh, catastrophic response to going through these periods of magnetism. So maybe it won't be so bad as to induce a pole shift, wipe out all of uh, most of humanity, and start us all over again, as has been these previous 11 times. Yeah, I mean, we're a species with amnesia, and we start over again and get up to this level and get knocked down and start over again, etc. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Hi, I'm Greg. I'm calling from Apollo Beach, Florida. You're on the air. Hi, Cliff and Patrick. Uh, Cliff, in the past you mentioned hyperchroniac humans. Uh, who hyperchroniac have, humans? Yeah, yeah. who oh. live in time differently than the main populace of the planet. Are you seeing any new linguistics on the hyperchroniac human? Yes, we're actually seeing that it's growing. The first indications that we had in our previous reports were, say, pointing to maybe... 1% uh, of 1% of a general populace having some experience of that. Now we're seeing that it's, it's up into where it's maybe, oh, 2 or 3 or 4% of 1% of the general populace, and we're starting to get some level of definition. So indeed, there are people that are uh, writing about their experiences uh, up in going through this. And then, unfortunately, there's, we're also getting indications of a lot of people that are going through these kind of episodes and don't know how to handle them and uh, are seeking medical aid for something that, you know, medicine just isn't going to help. Thank you. Well, you're quite welcome. Uh, what about, I uh, have a couple emails here, Cliff High, about the Federal Reserve. What does uh, linguistics say about, you know, there's so much being talked about now about the Federal Reserve. Yeah, we won't care about them as a country this in November of 2010. A country? As, a, as the U.S. or the planet, uh, we won't care about the Federal Reserve or the Federal Reserve Banks uh, from November of 2010 onward. 2010, so a year from now. Yeah, over the course of this next year, the dollar dies, and that's their only product. And, and why, so why, why should we care about them if no one's using their, their product? You mm -hmm. know? And when you say the dollar dies, give us an idea. What is, how does that look to those of us who use dollars? What, what? Well, first it's going to hit us with hyperinflation uh -huh. uh, and then deflation. The hyperinflation will come as all of the dollars come home to roost in the digital format. We'll try and absorb them for a while. But we're going to go to something where, you know, you'll wake up in the morning and your cup of coffee, if you went to Starbucks, would be $8.00. And you go to work, and then you come go to Starbucks on your way home, and that same cup of coffee is now nine fifty. 
and you wake up the next morning and it's ten ten dollars and fifty cents and so on and uh, the hyperinflation will go on for a short period of time perhaps months i don't know how long and then we're going to get into deflation because the dollar will be so rejected most of the digital forms of it will have disappeared all the derivatives will have just been written off and what we'll be left with will be all the printed dollars which will be of some value within the United States, but mostly not accepted anywhere else. And here in the United States, only accepted in um, in forms where they just can't get silver to trade or something like that. So, and what will the powers that be be doing now? Will they just be all be uh, moved to Uruguay or wherever they're going to go? Uh, actually, by the uh, by that period of time, those. Um, well, okay, we have to. The powers that be are going to be mostly insulated from this. These are the people that are at the sure. upper echelons of the shadow government. Mm-hmm, okay, mm-hmm. at some point in the in the process of the revolution, as we cross from November or cross into November of 2010, from that point on, uh, most of the powers that be are running for their lives. Uruguay, right? That, that's what I hear. Is no, it won't. It won't no? help. It doesn't matter. I mean, oh, it, they're going to. We're going to chase is, them this down. Is, huh? This is going to be planetary. <laughs> it's going to be. Yeah, unfortunately, it looks to be as bloody and as horrid as, as anything in the Bolshevik Revolution. Really? And uh, like the Bolsheviks, we will decide that we cannot allow the powers that be and their children to survive because they represent a, a danger to the mm-hmm. coming generations. Well, what do you make of? Uh, I don't know. I just have some friends and myself. That I look out in 2009, Cliff Hine, ladies and gentlemen, and, and the whole thing looks so surreal to me that on, on a deep level, I, I have no worries about it whatsoever. And, and I'm wondering if you can pinpoint what that kind of idea is, or is there a lot of that going around? Well, there, there actually is to a certain extent. Uh, we see a fair amount of people that are just mm, sanguine about it, you know, nothing we can do about it except live through it. And, you know, try and guard our, ourselves as we go through this stuff. And that really, the universe we know is an ordered, structured place. And so I don't personally have any fear about any of this stuff that's mm-hmm, coming. Mm-hmm. Because it's going to work out as it should. <laughs> yeah, know? I mean, what are you going to do? Exactly, exactly. I didn't create any of it, so I'm not taking any personal responsibility for it. I don't have to stay around and clean up the mess afterwards. So it's like, okay. And, and it's going to work out as it's supposed to. What's interesting for us is the way in which the linguistics suggest things working out is actually uh, beneficial to uh, humans in a long-term sense that I don't think we've had this potential for freedom for a long period of time, mm-hmm. maybe 500 years or more, because the these um, this small 1% or 2% is intent on dominating us all, and they'll be gone. And that's going to be good and bad. We're going to go through a uh, a period of disruption as we all try and decide what does the future mean when we're all sovereign individuals and there is no hierarchical authority that we have to deal with. It's a big paradigm shift. It's interesting, though, when you said something like, I didn't create any, any of this. Do you suppose, though, can it be argued that all of us souls that are a, a conscious today in 2009, on some level, that we had to have created all of this because and we do create our reality? No, I don't I don't subscribe to that theory because I look at it from a, a different viewpoint that is ancient in the form of uh, the science of yoga and Taoism. Mm-hmm. And in that concept, there's various levels of consciousness. There's universal consciousness that provides the ability of planets to create and rocks and trees and all of that. And then we can come all the way down to the personal level of consciousness, right? And that's where you and I exist. Mm-hmm. And yes, you can argue that we create our certain things within our own personal level of consciousness and maybe one or two layers up but for the vast majority of humans we're not out there putting any energy into creating the local rocks or the asphalt under our feet or so on and that's where a lot of these cycles and so forth are exhibiting and so at that's that level no you and i are not creating the revolutionary meme and to a certain extent the powers that be are not creating it it would hit us at this planet at this time whether we were uh, you know, ten or six and a half billion um, uh, Zen uh, monks sitting around meditating, or whether we are as are as are now, that same revolutionary set of energies would come out from the center of the the galaxy and would be hitting us. The issue is how we respond to it is based on where we are at this particular point. And so, since we're still kind of trapped in all of the violence and negativity and so forth, I suspect a lot of response will go that way. But if we were all sitting around as uh, meditating monks looking at the universe in a different perspective, maybe that revolutionary wave would allow us to create a, you know, something entirely new. This is, yeah, yeah. This is from Howard in Morro Bay, California. I would like to ask Cliff about what he calls 
immediacy values. If immediacy values tend to be the strongest or more accurate, then why doesn't he do another run associated with such an important date like the upcoming October 25th event? Well, that's a good question. Basically, it's just the huge amount of work involved. Um, Immediacy values are, uh, we slice and dice our our language into release language and uh, building tension language. But then uh, both of those types have categories of immediacy value, shorter term, and longer term. And we get more data, more detail in the immediacy values, probably because most people that are or most people are psychic, they don't know it, but their range doesn't extend out that far, and so they're psychically leaking out impressions that really only go out maybe three weeks. Hmm. Okay, hmm. and that's basically why we end up, in our theory anyway, is why we end up with more immediacy values. The problem, of course, is that those immediacy values are effective from three days out to three weeks, and it takes us about 18 days to process the stuff. Hmm. 